Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. There are people who have touched upon many lives in New York City, but how many of them are really from Lynn, Massachusetts, who, who are Boston Red Sox fans, who are, who, who are the rabbis to New York City? Today, I have my friend, someone I really consider a friend, a person I consider like a brother, the man who is the executive vice president of the New York Board of Rabbis, the chaplain to the fire department, the chaplain also to the prisons because that's where he originally came out of. <laughs> no, but really one of the finest human beings that everybody knows, the, uh, the host of Religion Online with the deacon, my good friend, Rabbi Joe Patazna. Thank you so much. When I walked in here and they said the host would be wearing suspenders, I thought I was going to do an interview with Larry King, but I was glad it was you. You, you know, I'm happy that you were able to find a blue shirt <laughs> and some. I other. borrowed it. I have to return yeah, this after it. the show. Okay, okay. Yeah. So let's stop kibitzing and let's do. You know, I, I didn't realize this is a, a life story as opposed to a kibitzing story. Right. Now, when you and I met, we were talking. Your parents were Holocaust survivors, and uh, you said to me, "You really, you, you, when your parents came over, they never really dis told you where they." which camp or anything, but we'll get to that. You were born in 1946 in a displaced... Yeah, I was born in Battenberg, Germany. And I always told my mother, thanks to that decision, I could never become president of the United States. She said, well, you could become secretary of state, as Henry Kissinger did. So we didn't completely limit your achievement. Now, how did your parents get over to Lynn, Massachusetts? In those years, 1940, they came here in 48, uh, you had to have a relative... Uh, living in one of the communities because the government refused uh, to assume responsibility for you financially. So my mother had a cousin uh, who lived in Lynn, Massachusetts, and that's how we end up in a community uh, of that nature, which I must say was very fortuitous because Lynn was a wonderful place to grow up. It was a small community. You said. Small community, but still large enough uh, to be considered a major community on the North Shore it was contiguous to Swampscott, uh, and you had a significant Jewish community. There were many synagogues. Uh, you know, for us, uh, we had three synagogues in Lynn. My family were members of all three. But I think part of that is because your father wanted to maintain the relationship, the continue, the, the continuity with the Jewish faith. Yeah, and he also said it was a statement because he lived during a horrific period when you couldn't be a member of a synagogue you couldn't uh, publicly identify as a Jew. So given the opportunity now to be free, he wanted to make sure that uh, he was visible 
uh, in every place. So we were supporters, which was a good thing because when the rabbi would see me and say, I didn't see you in shul, in synagogue, this so I was you at said, the other, you were at I was the other, at the other one. Yeah. But all, all joking aside, now, I think you, you said to me that you believe your, your mother and father had five children who, who perished in the, the camps. You know, it's interesting, Mike, because they never discussed their experience with me. I would hear them sometimes whisper to one another uh, in Yiddish and in English or with, so we had cousins, they would speak to them, but they never wanted to impose upon me the pain of the past. I think they made a very conscious decision. We have one child and we want to make sure he grows up in a positive environment. So uh, I, uh, I never received much information. Let's I saw pictures of those kids growing up. They kept pictures of them uh, on, a, uh, on a dresser. Oh, really? Yeah. So I knew that they were their children, but because of the kind of uh, relationship we enjoyed where we didn't talk about the past, I never asked what were their names, who were they. They were just part of the family. Now, now, your father, you said prior to the war, was involved with the produce business in Europe. Yeah, he, uh, he was in fruits and vegetables. And uh, in those years, that was a you know, very honorable profession, and that's what he did. Uh, and then he, when he went over to Lynn, <coughs> he started in produce, and then he opened up a... It was a know. natural kind of continuation for him. Uh, he was comfortable uh, in that setting, and he bought a grocery store in Lynn. Um, he may have bought it for about $5,000. I remember the number 5,000. I think it was a loan given by the Jewish community to recent uh, immigrants to help them establish uh, their lives. Uh, and I remember hearing the number 5,000. So that's what he paid for the grocery store. And uh, he worked, uh, he and my mother worked there, and I worked there part time. But uh, it was very demanding because in those years, it was a seven day a week commitment you had to make. So you. You're growing up over there. You're working part time in the grocery store. You're, you're enjoying the warmth of your parents. As you said to me, the only time you really were ever in New York City was to visit some relative who lived on Ocean Parkway. You never really knew New York. How did you decide that you wanted to go to Yeshiva University and become a rabbi? I really wasn't sure at first what I wanted to do. Uh, my mother had strongly encouraged me to consider medicine uh, as a possible professional choice. My father said, whatever makes you happy, of course, we'll be happy with. But I had established a very warm relationship with the hometown rabbi, Samuel Zajcik, uh, and his family. When I say warm relationship, he was the kind of person who was a rabbi on the pulpit, off the pulpit. Uh, he would welcome you to his home. I remember spending many a, a Shabbos, many a Sabbath there, uh, surrounded by the love of his family. He'd invite my parents there. Uh, he also took a special interest in my family because he knew a little bit about them and he felt we have to reach out and we have to make them feel as welcome as possible. Right, well, but you were telling me about something which uh, reminded you when you were in high school perhaps <coughs> for growing up, uh, Elie Wiesel's comment with the canteen. I went to hear Elie Wiesel speak and he talked about the following narrative. Two people are stranded in the wilderness there's enough water for one to drink. If both drink, both will die. Who drinks from the canteen? It's an interesting question that's raised in the Talmud. And after going back and forth in a discussion, the majority decision is the person who owns the canteen has the right to drink from it. And as Wiesel added, yes, he does. But he also knows he has a responsibility to perpetuate the memory of the one he left behind who couldn't drink from the canteen. When I heard that story, somehow everything connected. I said, I grew up seeing those kids, those pictures. I grew up knowing bits and pieces of a Holocaust background. I saw my family with numbers. And I said to myself, what am I gonna do to perpetuate that legacy? So the rabbinate for me uh, became but when you decision. started YU, did you realize you were going to, I mean, from YU, you could have gone into medicine. Oh, I was a biology I mean, major. I, was bi I thought I was going to go to medical school. Uh, you know, I, my mother gave every, every good argument as for making that choice. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I may have mentioned to you, she would call me every Wednesday when I was a rabbi and say, you know, if you had listened to me, Joe, you wouldn't be working today. You'd be out relaxing. That's right, you'd be golf. playing on the golf course. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but she also recognized 
that this was something I wanted to do. And like any parent, if this is your choice, we are comfortable with it. So it's 18, you're 18 years of age, you're never really in the city, and you end up in Washington Heights. How is, how is it, you know, for the Boston Red Sox fan to be, you know, not too far from Yankee Stadium, how, how was it growing, you know, your first formative years up at YU? Well, I, I would occasionally wear a Boston uh, Red Sox shirt, but on the inside. Uh, I was a fan on the inside because you wouldn't publicly uh, show your loyalty. Uh, but I, I came mean, but to Washington I'm Heights, I was lost. I used to get lost on the train. I couldn't find my way around. And I remember uh, saying to myself, how can, I, how can anybody live here? Uh, I thought I'd go back to Boston. But one thing about New York, the longer you're here, the more you become acculturated to it, the more you adapt to it, and after a while, you love it. And I really became a New Yorker, now, except that, for my sports loyalties. I realize. I've gone to the games with you too often. I realize <laughs> that situation. Uh, so what happened during the summer? You said, one summer you, you said you worked for the Parks Department? I worked for the Parks Department in Picking Boston. Picking up... Uh, yes, I was, I was very good at it, by the way. I, uh, I used to know how to pick up the leaves and how to pick up you know, uh, pieces of litter on the beach. I had a great tan uh, working uh, for the city of Boston. Um, but I also was a counselor at camps. Uh, and I suppose inspired by my parents, I couldn't just go to any camp as a counselor. It was a camp for kids from uh, broken homes, from kids from problematic homes. I grew up knowing you have to give back. You can't simply go through life uh, with closed eyes. Someone said those who close their eyes never see tears. So, so, and I was taught to keep my so eyes So when open. in your, your undergraduate did you make the decision that you were going to pursue the, the rabbinate? Well, at Yeshiva University, there's a dual program. We call it synthesis. You take your uh, Hebrew classes in the morning and your secular classes in the afternoon. I loved those classes, especially the classes in Talmud. I loved the debate, the discussion. Uh, and I said, this is something I would enjoy teaching, enjoy continuing to learn. And I was drawn to it, plus that desire to uh, remember those who are no longer living. And I felt, I don't think I can ever find this kind of personal, professional fulfillment in any other area except the rabbinate. So now you're 22, you enter the Ravel. Yeah, it was the Yitzhak uh Theological Seminary and Bernard Rebel Graduate School. Interestingly, at Yeshiva, which I think was much to their credit and continues to this day, you couldn't pursue an ordination, a theological degree, without having a secular degree. Because they knew very well, if you're going to be a rabbi on the pulpit, you're going to be addressing people who have other degrees. And you have to be on an equal level. So if you only went for an ordination without the secular attachment, they felt you were incomplete. Dr. Belkin, of blessed memory, who was a great president of yeshiva, thought it was important to prepare the rabbi for the American experience. It wasn't going to be a rabbi in Europe. It was going to be a rabbi in America. A rabbi in America has to be learned in different areas. You have to be uh, multidimensional. You just can't be one who's well-versed in Talmud. You have to know English and biology and psychology and everything else. That is why yeshiva, to me, was always a great school. So it's 1972. Mm -hmm. You're an ordained rabbi, and how do you find the job in Brooklyn? I mean, you, did you know what Brooklyn I was? I didn't get my job through the New York Times, uh, but I did look at newspapers, and there was one paper, I think it was called the Jewish Post and Opinion, and all of a sudden I see this listing for a rabbi in Brooklyn. Now, as you had mentioned earlier, my only exposure to Brooklyn was a cousin who lived in Ocean Parkway, and growing up, whenever anybody was on a TV show, they said, where are you from? They said, Brooklyn, there was an automatic cheer from the audience. So I knew it was a popular place, um, and I knew there was an ocean parkway. So I went to a synagogue called Mount Sinai, Congregation Mount Sinai, with an attached... An established, Tucker. I mean, it was, it was founded in the 1800s. 1882, it was founded. Sophie Tucker, great performer, was a member. Her brother, Moab Yuza, was his name. He was a member. It was at Skemahorn On Street. Skirmahorn Street, which... 305 Skemahorn? Yeah, 305 Skirmahorn. So I immediately... Uh, went to a place where I couldn't spell the street, let alone pronounce the street. It took me a while to learn Skirmahorn. Um, but again, I met these wonderful people who uh, said we'd love but to have you. You're a kid at this time. I was, I mean, I was a kid. I, I mean, and you, you basically had a, a rabbi who 
was retiring. You had a congregation which was, I mean, it was downtown Brooklyn, and downtown Brooklyn really didn't, I mean, the only thing that was really, there was Mays and there was A&S. You know, and they was, were members of the synagogue. Right. It was a business community. Right. It was a very business community. It was a top-notch retail, but the community did not have people really living there. You know, it's interesting because you're right. There was no residential population supporting the synagogue there. They came from elsewhere, from Brooklyn Heights, from Park Slope, from Midwood. People had developed a loyalty and love for this congregation because Rabbi Isidore Aaron, my predecessor, was extraordinary. Now, what you said to me, it's learning process of everything else. At that time, you know, you were a rabbi and you had experience at the school, but you really wanted to learn how to become a, a pulpit rabbi and have the capability of giving sermons and, and understanding. So you traveled around Brooklyn and heard the, 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 the speeches and the sermons of some of the best rabbis. I thought, if I'm going to learn, let me learn from the best. Who were the best at that time in my uh, eyes? It was Harry Halpern of the East Midwood. It was Boris Silverstein at Temple Emanuel in Borough Park. It was Benjamin Z. Kreitman at the Brooklyn Jewish Center. It was Leon Fink at Temple Beth Sholem. They were the greats. So I gravitated to them. I schlepped along. Wherever they went, I went. I used to sit in the last row listening to their sermons. And then I expanded my reach. I went to Riverside Church. I wanted to hear some of the great preachers there because, you know, Fosdick was there, then Forbes was there. And I said, you can learn from everyone. Learn from their style. Learn from their substance. So, so, but now, you know, it's very interesting. This is 72, and you said to me, I mean, my joke, which I'm, I'm so proud that I tell everybody that you've been on Religion on the Line since 1982, the longest show on talk radio on ABC, but you really started in 75. You said to me there was a, there was a show on ABC, uh, something with well, a new... Uh, let me tell you my, my exposure to TV and radio in New York. The New York Board of Rabbis got a call from a program called To Tell the Truth, where they were looking for imposters. And I started off on this show, one segment, as a matchmaker. As a matter of fact, it was a priest and I who stumped the panel. And I'll never forget, I got, it was a Goodson Todman production. I got $150 and a case of Hormel ham patties. So I you gave that a, to the priest. I said, yeah, he never sent me his $150, but he took the Hormel ham patties. So that was my first introduction. Shortly thereafter, at ABC, there was a program called The Jewish World This Week. And they called the board of rabbis and said, do you have someone who you think could host this program? You're 29 years of age. And then. they said, well, we got a young kid. We think, you know, he's got some personality. Try him. And uh, I went for the, uh, you know, uh, the tryout and was approved. I, and I taped the show, I'll never forget, Ron Lundy was in the next studio. This was at ABC in its early days. Howard Cosell, speaking of sports, would tape his show after mine, and he was punctual. He used to come into that studio. Not like you. Exactly. And what happened was, invariably, I would run late. He would get angry, but we developed a friendship. And after a while, he learned, let me not come on time, because he won't be finished on time. But we became, you know, uh, fairly close in those years. He was, he was brilliant. Howard Cosell had a mind that was, he would have succeeded in anything you would have done. So, so you get that show on radio. We'll get to 82, because 82 is an interesting time also. In 19, when is it, 1976, when did you decide to go to law school? No, I went to law school in 82. 82, the, the same, same time year, right, that exactly, you got on WABC. Exactly, and, I, and WABC originally was just you and a priest. No, ABC first was a tape program. Then, when ABC changed its format, remember they had music. Right, when they yeah, went to No More Music, Talk Radio, 82, I was part of the Talk Radio team. They said, would you consider doing a different kind of program on religion live every Sunday morning from 6 to 9? And I just was accepted at Brooklyn Law School. And I called my advisor and friend, Leon Fink, and I said, Leon, how can I do law school and radio simultaneously? He said, Joe, if you love something, you can do it. So I decided I loved radio, and I wanted to go to law school so I wouldn't leave either one. As a matter of fact, when I used to complain to Leon about law school, I used to say, Leon, I can't take it. It's too much work. He said, so, so drop out. I said, Leon, 
they're going to have to throw me out. I'm not dropping out. So you do law school in a, a part-time program. Yeah. I was the oldest student during the day and the one of the youngest at night. I combined day and night. And in addition, at that time, you're still at the synagogue, yeah. the, the rabbi. And were you also now at the, um, the courts being the rabbi? Yes, because Mount Sinai, uh, which was then in the process of moving to Brooklyn Heights, enjoyed a close relationship with the surrounding legal community. So you had members of the bench and bar. So judges would come into the synagogue, lawyers would come in. So my going to law school also was a, uh, a natural uh, kind of decision in that setting. And Leon Fink, my closest friend, went to law school and was a rabbi. Gil Clapperman, uh, who's a professor of mine at Yeshiva University, also a lawyer. So I said, uh, I and, want to do this. And then you said, you, you, at one time, you even thought that you're going to maybe do some legal work. And Joe Hines even asked you to work maybe for the DA's District office. Attorney Hines said, would you consider doing some uh, uh, work in the courtroom? Because, you know, he had come to the synagogue on various uh, occasions. He said, I think you'd be good, you know, in terms of uh, litigation, in terms of being maybe, you know, a prosecutor. Um, it was interesting because there was a Father LaRocca who was a priest. He was on the other side. He did defense work, 18B defense work. I said, oh, that's going to be great. The rabbi is the prosecutor. The priest is the defender. Uh, but I felt you can't pursue two careers. How would you get involved with the fire department? 1999, I received a phone call from the mayor's office. Then was the mayor was uh, Rudolph Giuliani, and we knew each other. And they said, we'd like to suggest you as the chaplain, Jewish chaplain of FDNY. I said, I've never been a firefighter. When I was a kid, I thought I'd like to be a firefighter like all the other kids. But yeah, it's something, why not? It'd be an honor to be associated with FDNY. So I went for an interview. Tom Van Essen was the commissioner. Uh, he said, uh, I've seen your credentials here. I think you would be a good fit for us. I said, well, let's try it. And I have to tell you, Mike, there were no finer people than the members of FDNY. I consider them the most religious people in the world because they are ready to risk their lives to save lives. How many people do we know will do that? With about five minutes left, I have to make sure I get a lot, a little bit more in. Um, I can stay, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to fast forward slightly. You have, you over the years, you, you, you've had every position with the uh, New York Board of Rabbis as a rabbi. And then subsequently, like in 2004, uh, the, the position came up to be the executive the vice president. Let's talk about that for a second. I love the New York Board of Rabbis. Where can you find an address that allows you to converse and cooperate with all the different streams of Jewish life, to have a relationship with the archdiocese, with the council of churches, with people of different faith constituencies? So the board, to me, was a great treasure. and. Uh, the opportunity to serve as, as executive vice president was a great honor, and I, uh, I applied, uh, I was accepted, and uh, they didn't ask for my reference. Otherwise, I, well, they did, but I told them you were out of town for the last, you know, for that year. Uh -huh. With regard to that, since we both have another thing in common, um, ten ten wins. How did you get over to ten ten wins? I knew Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum. I, I used to listen to his commentaries. He was. Uh, a great representative to the Christian community because he would do a lot of interfaith work. And he died. And there was an, a search for a successor. And my name was given to them and you had to do a trial commentary. And you had to speak for 60 seconds. As you know, wins is very strict. You're allowed two seconds over or under. And my, remember, members of my congregation said to me, if you can speak for 60 seconds, why do we have to listen to 25 minutes? Uh, so I became a religious commentator on 1010 Wins. Another, uh, uh, I, I felt it was a great position of distinction. Three minutes left before, okay, I'm gonna, because I, I don't want to miss. You have a son? A great son named Harrison. Who lives in Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado, yes. And he's a, a grad, he has a degree in psychology. He'll be working with kids with special needs. Uh, he's going to come to New York now and work here, and spend more time with his father. 9-11. Let's get to that for the last couple of minutes. 9-11, you're in the gym. You're in the Gold's Gym in downtown Brooklyn. What happens? I see the pictures uh, that everyone has seen. I thought it was surreal. Uh, and then I realized it was real. I ran to the synagogue. 
Uh, we set up a triage center under the supervision of the 84th Precinct, and then I, uh, I asked to go over to Ground Zero. And I went over, and I spent every day there for at least a month. I sounded the chauffeur there before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we cited prayers over bodies, over body parts, saw parents searching for their kids, uh, went to the morgue, which was in Brooks Brothers, uh, transformed by 9-11. Uh, 343 firefighters lost their lives, thousands of people. You told me an interesting thing. It's like the, the how fragile our life is. The day before, you were with... Uh, Father Michael Father Judge. Father Michael Judge. Who stood up in front of a, a firehouse in the community in the Bronx, and he said, remember, hold on to memory, hold on to the moment, hold on to each other. A day before 9-11, he lost his life on 9-11, his words were prophetic, and I have quoted him so many times. And frankly, Mike, that's how all of us got through 9-11, by, uh, by doing exactly what he advised us to do the day before. And, and you've been there at Ground Zero every year. Oh, yeah, we've had Hanukkah observances there, Slichot, the Saturday evening before Rosh Hashanah there. Um, it, is, it's, it is a special See, place. you know what, what's interesting? You, you know, everybody calls you rabbi, but like when you and I go to Madison Square Garden or we go to Yankees, it's not rabbi. It, you are the, the rabbinic, the, you're the rabbi for the Jews, the Christians, and everyone for this community, because that's who you are. I mean, many people have seen you, and this is, you, you may be the Jewish rabbi, but you are part of the, for, uh, the, the, of the city. Mike, when my parents came to Lynn, Massachusetts, one of the first groups to reach out to them and to help them rebuild their lives were the nuns of St. Mary's Church. I've always felt that we have a responsibility to each other and we're all part of one human family. Our spiritual birth certificate is the same. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. So we are proud of our faith, but we also have to be respectful of another faith and work together. And more important, I'm proud to consider you a dear friend. Well, you are Thank one you. of my closest friends. Thank you. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickoff Group, Urban American.